All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm John Lawrence. I handle Congressional Affairs for the uh, International Foundation for Electoral Systems. I don't know if many of you are familiar with IFAS, but we are um, the, the leading technical elections assistance and democracy promotion NGO. And we've worked in over 100 countries now over the past 24 years. And what we do is, is we provide technical insights into uh, electoral processes based on an analysis of the electoral system, the laws, and, and that's exactly what we're doing today. After the <coughs> 2009 Iranian elections, it was clear that there was a, a real lack of understanding of the, the basics of the system in Iran. There was a lot of press in the West about what had happened afterward, um, but there was very little understanding of the system. So we were actually lucky because we had wanted to do something on it, and then Yasmin here came to us with a, a concept that turned into this book, which you can get on your way out and is now up on our website as well. Um, and that's why we're here today. This book is also it's a, a continuum in a series of IFAS publications. We, we do a lot of programming around the world, and we're, we're a thought leader in how to develop programs. What we're doing in the past few years is also putting it down on paper. So we've produced um, country-specific papers on Tunis, on Tunisia, and Egypt, in fact, when uh, Tahrir Square started, we had the only uh, definitive analysis, as far as I know, of the Egyptian constitution, electoral laws. Um, obviously, once the, the military stepped in, all those went by the by. But at the point, it, it really did matter whether or not people were calling, for example, for Mubarak to resign because there, were, there was a series of unintended consequences if you did that. And, and everything we have, this book, Tunisia, everything is available on, um, on our website at ifas.org. And we also hit topical issues on electoral fraud, and we have a, a forthcoming book on electoral dispute resolution, which I just read over the weekend, and it, it's relevant today because there was one quotation that was very, very telling. It said, as a practical and philosophical matter, to enforce the rule of law, official election results have a presumption of validity which shouldn't be that surprising, but you really need then to understand the system that much more if you're going to end up with a result that has a presumption of validity and you really need to live with it as opposed to just fight against it. Now that said, this study takes a very neutral stance and, and Yasmin will, will explain that. Um, and I'd like to stress that the views of everyone up here are their own views, not, not those of IFAS. Uh, each speaker here will talk for about 10 minutes and then get followed by a, a Q&A session. So first, if you could all turn off cell phones just so no one's interrupted. Um, Yasmin will, will cover her study and the, the system in general. And then we'll have um, Andy Reynolds, and I'll introduce everybody in a second, who will look, take a more general look at electoral systems and their importance. And he wrote a paper, co-wrote a paper back in 2002 where he said, electoral systems are important because politicians and activists believe they're important. So, you know, it's, it's not just a dry analysis of laws. These, these things actually matter. And Barbara will respond to them and, and give most likely a, a, a broader context to, uh, to our discussion. So our, our panelists today are Yasmin Alam, who's the, the author of the study. She was born and raised in Iran, and I, I won't go through all their bios. You, you have them here, so I'll just hit highlights. Um, She's a specialist in international development with more than seven years of, of research and management experience in international organizations. Andrew Reynolds, who um, has worked for IFAS for many years, and I met him today, and he described himself as an honorary IFAS intern because he's up here so much and still doesn't have a desk to call his own. Um, he's an associate professor of political science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And his research and, and teaching focus on democratization, constitutional design and electoral politics. He just had a, a book come out in December called Designing Democracy in a Dangerous World, which hits on the themes that we're about to talk to today. And Barbara Slavin is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and actually just spoke on Friday about the third installment of an Iran, second, second <laughs> installment of a series of Iran papers that the Atlantic Council has been putting off. Uh, she's an expert on U.S. foreign policy and, and author of a book called on Iran called Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, Iran, the U.S., and a Twisted Path to Confrontation. She's a contributor to AOLnews.com, foreignpolicy.com, 
and you probably know her, her best as assistant managing editor for uh, the world and national security at the Washington Times, and she was also a diplomatic reporter for USA Today for many years. And, and from seeing her speak on Friday, I also found out that, um, as she put it, she, she goes, we are, of course, also clairvoyant. So it'll be very interesting to see what she has to say. And we'll start with Yasmin, please. Try to take care of that right now. I'm uh, just go ahead and start. Sorry. Thank you, John, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to say that it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I want to thank IFAS for organizing this event and all of you for coming out on such a beautiful and sunny day. I think in the last two months, we've all been very captivated by the events that have happened in the Middle East and North Africa. I've personally been watching Al Jazeera nonstop, and less than two years ago, similar protests erupted in Iran following the disputed 2009 election. As um, turmoil engulfed the country, there was sort of an influx of analysis as to what happened with the 2009 election. And as John pointed out, there was really, um, from, from this analysis, there was something that was missing, and that was an understanding of the Iranian electoral system, its framework, its history, and the events that led up to the 2009 election. What I've done in Duality by Design is, um, is to provide a context under which elections take place in Iran. I've looked at the rules of the game, but I haven't looked at any particular poll. Essentially, my goal was really to provide, um, sort of to shed light on the modus operandi of a complex system. I think most people who study Iran look at political actors, their orientations, and the rivalries amongst them. But very often, um, people spend time looking at institutional developments in Iran. I think the nexus between the two will provide a more promising analysis of Iranian affairs. The Islamic Republic is really a Byzantine political structure um, with different nodes of power. You have the office of the Supreme Leader, you have the Guardian Council, the Expediency Council, Parliament, President, Council of Ministers. Um, but out of all of these levers of power, there are only four directly elected institutions that are permitted by the Constitution. What I've done in Duality by Design is look at three of these and their elections. So I'll sort of start off by giving you just a very brief overview of the electoral process for parliamentary, presidential, and local council elections, and then I'll move on to my five main points. Um, every four years, 290 deputies are directly elected from Iran's 207 electoral districts. The election formula is based on a two-round voting system, um, pretty standard if um, candidates who are who won in the first round win by one-fourth of the majority of votes. Um, and roughly every 150,000 Iranians elect one member to the majlis. Presidential elections are also held at four-year intervals. Um, the president occupies the highest post uh, in the Islamic Republic, after that of the leader, of course. The electoral formula is based on a majority round-off system. What that translates into is that for a contender to win the vote, he would need to secure 50 plus 1% of the popular vote. Finally, local council elections are also held every four years. It's interesting to note that they only started in 1999 having these elections, um, because even though the Constitution of 1979 envisioned these councils, it took 20 years between the Guardian Council, the Majlis, and two administrations to decide on the functions of these local councils as well as the electoral law for them. Uh, roughly 110,000 councillors are elected every four years and uh, the, the, uh, the election is based on a single round of plurality voting. I think it's obvious that in many ways the Iranian political system is a hybrid system. It has paradoxical, uh, it's very paradoxical in nature, but it has elements of democracy, theocracy and authoritarianism. Um, much is true about the Iranian electoral system, which is the focus of our talk today here. It's really a conflation of democratic and authoritarian elements. 
I think it's almost impossible for me to summarize this booklet in 10 minutes. So what I'll try to do is I'll highlight five points that I think are important for understanding the electoral system. Um, they've all been described in detail in the report that's, I think, available outside uh, and can be downloaded from IFAS's website. So the first point I want to start with is talk about just the nature of elections in Iran. I think it's accurate that we, we can't describe elections in free and fair in Iran, but we can't also discount them or say that they're insignificant. Over the past 32 years, elections have shaped the Iranian landscape and determined the Islamic Republic's trajectory. Um, what I mean by this is that the political currents as well as the circulation of elite have been the product of the electoral process. I'll give you an example. Um, the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, was a two-term president back in the 1980s. Former President Rafsanjani, as well as Khatami, and even opposition figure Mehdi Karabi all served in the parliament. Actually, two of them were speakers of parliament. Interestingly, Mr. Ahmadinejad ran two unsuccessful bids for elected office, once for the local councils and the second time for parliamentary elections. The list goes on and on. I won't bore you with the details, but um, I'll move on to the political currents and what I mean that the political currents are the result of the electoral process. The reform movement was born out of a cleavage between the Islamic coalition that was created during the 1980 parliamentary elections. By 1984, the Islamic coalition uh, from different organizations, associations, had a rupture. And out of that came the radical left or reformists and the radical right or conservatives, which have really dominated um, electoral politics in Iran for the past, I would say, 30 years, in the 80s, 90s, and even up to the 2000s. So I guess to sum up, Iran's electoral system is neither a single party system nor is it a pluralistic one. In fact, um, political parties don't even exist in the real, real definition of the term in Iran. What we have is factional politics. We have factions that pop up before and during elections, form coalitions to really increase their chances for victory. And we've had two factions in the past 30 years, as I described before. The second point I want to talk about today is, contrary to conventional wisdom, the Guardian Council, which is, I would say, described as one of the most formidable obstacles to free and fair elections to Iran, is not an invention of the Islamic Republic. In fact, the revolutionaries borrowed the concept of the Guardian Council from the Ancien Regime. The idea for establishing a body composed of senior clerics, overseeing legislation passed in parliament to prevent those in conflict with Islamic code from becoming legislation was really outlined in the Constitution of 1906. Um, at that time, the Constitutionists didn't draw a boundary between religion and politics, and I think inadvertently um, brought in religion into the modern conception of democracy in Iran. The institution itself is based on the Senate under the monarchy, which was dissolved in 1979. The body today stands uh, with 12 members. Six of them are clerics who are appointed by the leader of Iran. Six of them are uh, Muslim lawyers who are nominated by the head of the judiciary and voted in by members of the majlis. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the Guardian Council, and I think everyone knows the Guardian Council as the body that vets candidates and filters out disqualified ones. I think one thing that needs to be understood about the Guardian Council is that its powers are far more exhaustive and elusive than that. The Guardian Council really sets electoral policies. It determines the date of elections. It annuls, it has the power to annul elections in a polling station, district, or even stop the electoral process altogether. It does this with the help of 384 offices it has across Iran's counties and provinces um, with full-time staff working year-round. I think in many ways it dwarfs the Ministry of Interior and uses it as an implementing arm of its own policies. I think another thing that can be said about the Guardian Council is that it's been really untouchable. In 2000, President Khatami introduced a twin bill that aimed to curtail the powers of the Guardian Council by removing its vetting rights. 
Unfortunately, a two-year battle between the Guardian Council, uh, the Ministry of Interior, as well as uh, the administration f ended with the Guardian Council winning and becoming in, even bolder with its actions. So I'll move on to my fourth point. I think observers of Iranian politics focus ma mainly on unelected institutions. But holding power is far more assured in those institutions than it is in elected institutions. Let me explain what I mean by this. Ahmad Janati, the current secretary of the Guardian Council, has been in this position for over 30 years. The same can be true about many members of the Expediency Council, which was established back in the 80s, because they're direct appointees of the leader. In contrast, there is significant circulation of power in Iran's elected institutions. I'll take the parliament as an example. Since 1980, the incumbency rate in parliament has varied between 20 to 34 percent. That means the majority of parliamentarians have been freshman deputies. I'll use another example to sort of um, open this up more. Since 1984, there has been a steady declericalization of parliament. In 1984, the parliament had 55% clerics. Flash forward 12 years later, this number had dropped to 19%. Today, clerics only make up 14% of the parliament. Um, I've talked about other membership trends in the report. If you're interested to learn more about the ratio of women to men, as well as the education and um, <coughs> age of MPs, you can look in the report. My last point of, is about the Islamic Republic's archaic <coughs> understanding of elections. What I mean by this is the Islamic Republic equates higher voter turnout with the concept of Islamic bayah. Put simply, the Islamic Republic interprets the participation of Iranians, actually the high participation of Iranians in elections, as the renewal of allegiance with the regime. It uses it as a source of legitimacy. In reality, this is not true. In the past, I would say 10 to 15 years, the elections that have had the highest voter turnout have been elections that have re resulted in unfavorable, uh, have produced unfavorable results for the regime. I'll use three examples to demonstrate this. In 1997, the upset victory of Mohammad Khatami engaged 80% of the electorate. They said no to the sort of this choice of the establishment and yes to a little known cleric, Mohammad Khatami. In 2000 parliamentary elections, over 67% of eligible voters came out to vote in a reformist um, majlis. To give you an example, 29 out of 30 seats in the district of Tehran went through candidates that were closely affiliated with the reformist movement. Finally, the 2009 elections. 85% of the population came out, voted, and as they say, the rest was history. To sum up, the majority of elections with high voter turnout have really been a vote of no confidence to the establishment, if you want to simplify what I just tried to say in my fifth point. Now, all of the points are, that I've mentioned are really just a snapshot of the electoral system. Um, there's much more than what I've said in the report, um, issues ranging from the role of election management bodies all the way to the administration of affairs, referendums, electoral reform, and you might want to just pick up the publication if you're interested to learn more. Um, I would like to conclude today by looking to the slotted 2012 parliamentary elections. Uh, in March 2012, Iranians will take to the polls for the first time after the 2009 disputed elections. Without a doubt, these elections will be a litmus test to the future of electoral politics in Iran. It's still a little too early to make a prediction as to what will happen, but it's quite possible that we will witness a fundamental realignment of factional <coughs> politics in Iran, with the neoconservatives ascending to power, even more than they are today, and the elimination of reformists. I think I'll stop here. And um, I'd be happy to elaborate on any of the points I've mentioned in the Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you, and uh, thank you, John, and thank you to uh, IFRS and all the IFRS people here today uh, for having me up to DC to uh, be part of this event. I, uh, I should firstly congratulate Yasmin because um, I was uh, had the uh, honor of uh, being a desk reader to, to, to check through some of this material um, and really thought it was the most uh, fabulous description um, of uh, a, a political electoral system that I knew very little about. Um, Yasmin has done a terrific job, and I think IFAS have done a great service for producing this document. Um, and I should also stress that uh, I have um, been brought up here to really uh, talk to you very briefly about the importance of elections. Um, which seems somewhat um, unusual in this building. Uh, everybody should hopefully understand the importance of elections here. Um, maybe we should take it out of Capitol Hill and uh, explain it there. But uh, this um, is not an area of my uh, expertise, Iran itself, but I think that uh, the questions that are coming up in Iran and the questions about political design that are highlighted in this report are obviously exceptionally salient um, to democratization anywhere and speak to issues of change and representation of governance in a number of new cases. I believe there's some large events going on somewhere in the world, but I've, it's been passing me by as an Africanist, the sub-Saharan Africanist. Um, it's certainly true that elections in um, a democratizing state are not always perceived to be a good thing, a, a, a normatively positive thing. Clearly, there are so many problems of flawed and delegitimizing elections that we cannot assume that the mere holding of elections in themselves um, will necessarily move a society forwards in a democratic sense or in a sense of um, social inclusion and human rights and civil rights and toleration. Um, there have been a few books recently that have appeared on the topic of how elections are perhaps fairly vacuous in the developing world and we shouldn't obsess or throw our money at them. If you look at authors like Robert Kaplan of the Atlantic Monthly, even Fareed Zakaria, uh, Paul Collier at Oxford, all talk about the deeply problematic moments that elections bring. And in some senses, they can be talking and are talking about the Iranian history and precedence of elections where elections have not led to liberalization and transformation in that society, um, at least in the most recent time period. But that being said, as I said, I wanted to talk about why elections can be good things. And clearly, if we think about many cases over the last 20 to 30 years, elections are moments of opportunity and they can be used as a significant moment to herald and facilitate change. Not overnight dramatic change, but at least beginning the steps forward to a different type of governance, moving from authoritarianism, perhaps to pseudo-democracy, which hopefully may eventually transform and transmute into established, consolidated democracy. In other cases, we've seen that these elections are important because they become a census on who should be sharing power and who should be listened to. Sometimes in those power sharing arrangements uh, before elections, uh, strong leaders are given the reins of power, but they have no legitimacy to base that, base that on per se. I think Southern, uh, North and South Sudan may be a good example of that in 2005. Until you get to elections, until you actually take the pulse, hopefully fairly, of the electorate, you don't know exactly who should be sharing power. Um, if you remember, people in the U.S., some people in the U.S. were quite up on Ahmad Chalabi before he stood for elections and then did not seem to be quite the populist that we had expected um, or others had expected. They also a cathartic psychological moment. I mean, we saw a psychological moment in the previous elections in Iran, but it was not as cathartic in the sense that there wasn't the transformation that that moment brought. But any of you, and I actually see people who I think were in South Africa in 1994, saw a cathartic psychological moment of change and transformation when people haven't had the opportunity to vote or vote in elections that really meant anything before. Actually coming out and marking that cross, making that tick, putting your thumbprint down becomes a moment of validation for the citizen and actually goes a long way in moving the state forward, despite the fact there are many other things to do. 
Elections in themselves are obviously problematic and flawed in many cases, but the, repeti the, the, the repet uh, repetitive notion of elections, the repeating of good quality elections becomes, I think, the sine qua non of democracy. You cannot have a vibrant democracy without choosing those leaders and holding them accountable, and that requires legitimate and regular elections. Now, it's certainly true that as in Iran, an election can merely just be the veneer uh, that, that hides deep illegitimacy in the state and authoritarianism in the state. But that's not to say that future elections in 2012 and any other time in Iran or elsewhere cannot provide the fulcrum leverage moment where the old regime really has to transform itself and new types of politics come to power and hopefully they're more progressive and they're more democratic. Briefly, if we talk about the election system itself, because Yasmin's document focuses very heavily on the rules of the game, and sometimes we hear our policymakers say, well, it doesn't matter so much what the rules of the game are. Um, we just need a free election, a fair election. Let's not tinker with the old rules or try and unpack the Pandora's book box of drawing new district lines or changing voting styles. Um, but in fact, We've seen time and time again that the rules of the game are a huge determining factor in the voices that will be within that legislature or that local government or that constitutional assembly and who has power and who can wield that power. And if you're in a transformational process, maybe you're choosing a constitutional assembly, which some countries are doing. Maybe you're trying to design new political laws and electoral rules getting the voices into parliament to the assembly becomes a, a huge element of a successful transition. And in contrast, exclusionary elections, elections that really only give the floor to one or two large parties or the Anshon regime or the new organized parties, and you can insert your own party labels into these um, generic concepts when we're thinking about North Africa and the Middle East. But elections that really advantage the big and the old and the established are going to produce a very different type of parliament or assembly than those that are much more inclusive and open up the floor to majority and minority parties, whether they be ideological or regional or